Well, good morning, everybody. So good to see you all here with us in worship. Let's all stand and sing. joyful noise before you. We come here this morning to worship and to praise you, glad that we live in this country filled with such beautiful examples of your creation. Yet, joyful noises are not easy for everyone to make as we come burdened down with the stresses of daily living and all that involves. Some wearied from tasks of serving others, some worried over the state of the world, and where that all is leading. Speak to us all, O oh God, in the stillness of this time and remind us of Jesus' willingness to take our burdens upon himself, to experience his gentleness and steadfast love for all. This we pray in his name.
Twins. Hello. There we go. All right. Good morning, everyone. We are so happy to have you with us here this morning, whether that be in person with us or join us online today. Um, I would like to um, just encourage you for a quick moment to, um, whether on your phone or online, take a moment. Please fill out your connection card. Let us know you're here and worship, worshiping with us this morning. Uh, really helps us out. Um, all right. So a couple little announcements here. I um, want to know that Timothy Team and Basement are both now back up and going. Um, they're both in the fellowship hall. Uh, the Timothy Team starts at 545 and Basement starts at 645. So we're glad to have those uh, programs back up and going. I um, also want to say today is the last day that we can bring the gifts to uh, bless our teachers. Um, they are going through so much right now with new ways that they have through their curriculums that they didn't plan for. So anything we can do to help bless our teachers and let them know they're appreciated is a major blessing. Um, and that will be to the missions table in the narthex. And all right, so we'll open up to joys and concerns this morning. Yes. No, no. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. All right. So, prayers for healing and wisdom with doctors is. is there. Yes. All right, so we want to lift up uh, Silent Springs Nursing and Rehab Center. Um, they're having some COVID actually go around, and, you know, people are being discouraged, and, you know, it's just a scary time. So we want to pray for peace and for healing to be with them, the workers, and everybody. Yes, Journey. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> uh, a prayer I think we all have on our hearts is that we want this thing to just, we want this to go away, and we want to get back to normal. Amen. Yes. Uh, our neighbor's son has surgery. Oh. Surgery. Gotcha. All right. So neighbor uh, knee surgery, some healing. All right. Yes. Wow. All right. Well, that's a great celebration. Yes. All right, so prayers for healing. All right. All right, well, let's take these uh, joys and concerns to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord, we thank you for your glorious love and mercy that you show upon us each and every day, even in these uncertain times. I ask that you be with the members of the congregation this morning that we have so many prayers for healing and medical issues. We know you can work miracles within those that you can bring peace, comfort, healing, wisdom to doctors, and comfort to families that are going through these things with their family members. I want to lift up the uh, Asylum Springs Nursing and Rehab Center. For those people in there that you know, may be sick with this new illness, that there's a lot of fear going around, that once again praying for peace and for wisdom for them and their families, and for the workers that still go every day into this environment to help those and care for those in need, that they will be protected as they're doing such a good work for those uh, people. Um, I ask that, you know, as we're going through this time of the coronavirus, as uh, our journey brought up, that we know this will come to an end and that we will see your glory come and shine through it. I ask that you give us all the strength and the perseverance and patience to see through this and know that you are with us even in these very uncertain times. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And then I'll pass it off to Clark for the mission moment this morning. Thank you, uh, uh, Tyler. I want to just uh, take a moment and, and just uh, 
share with you just a, a little bit about um, how, um, just how proud and how excited I am about the faithfulness of this church. So uh, uh, last week we, we closed the end of, of August, and, and typically when we come into the, to the summer months, um, you know, they tend to be a little bit softer in giving and everything. People are kind of on vacation doing things like that. And, and, and June and July were, were soft months. But, but, uh, but really, this church has turned out. And in August, uh, not only did we meet uh, the budget, but we went, we went above what we met for the budget, and um, we, we made some ground. And uh, um, we're, we're in the black for probably the first time I can think of in, after August and stuff. And so uh, thank you so much for your faithfulness. Thank you for for continuing to give, and thank you to so many of you who are online and have not set foot in this church since March for continuing to be faithful in your tithes and your offerings. And so thank you, church, um, for, for taking seriously our vows of prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. And so I just wanted to update y'all and let you know. Uh, that being said, um, it's a new month. And that means we need to continue to stay, uh, stay with it and continue to be faithful throughout, and so we can finish this year in a good situation. So thank you again. Um, speaking of which, on the screen, uh, you should have uh, different ways that you can give. Uh, if you are not here, uh, you can mail your checks or your money to the to your offering to the church. You can also go online on the web. You can text it to 479-334-0888. And that goes for everyone who's gathered here today. You can give in all those three ways, as well as as you leave this, uh, this morning, um, you can place an offering uh, in the box in the back, and uh, we'll, we'll get that taken care of. And so we want to, again, thank you for being faithful. And also, I want to just uh, give a little plug um, be on the lookout next week. Um, I'm going to share. We're going to share a little bit about ways that you can support the relief efforts for Hurricane Laura. Um, uh, several people have asked about how you, how can we do that, and most of the time we want to encourage people to go to UMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief. And so we'll have some information next week on if you want to uh, support the relief efforts uh, through UMCOR to take care of her uh, folks who've been impacted by Hurricane Laura. So be on uh, be. Uh, be tuned. Stay tuned for that. Let's, uh, let's pray over our offering. Most gracious and loving God, Lord, we give you thanks for, uh, for this day and for the faithfulness of this church. We just pray that you will continue to bless us as we continue to, uh, to seek to be guided by uh, your vision for this church, uh, that we strive to be a Christ-centered church, a caring community, growing deeper in faith, reaching out in love, and making a difference in the, in the lives of our neighbors near and far. Thank you, Lord. Be with us now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Well, it's always uh, what such a, a pleasure to hear Bill Peabody Band, uh, even if it's uh, uh, from a past performance. And uh, uh, but they do such a wonderful job, and we look, I think we all look forward to the day maybe when we can have them here live again, right? And so uh, we will we will hope for that and work towards that. But it is good to hear uh, hear them and be reminded of of the way in which we can worship the Lord in so many different ways. So. So this week we are um, in the third week of our sermon series, Head Scratchers. Uh, sometimes the words of Jesus don't make sense. Um, we're, we're looking at passages in the Gospels where, um, where, where sometimes the words of Jesus can be a bit puzzling, maybe a little mysterious, and, and, uh, and it all, all of it helps us to reveal the priorities um, about the kingdom of God uh, through, through all these different stories that we are looking at. So this Sunday, uh, today, we are looking at, at, at Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 through 15. And, and we're specifically going to look at verse 12, which is maybe the most head-scratching of all the verses we study. So if you've got your Bibles with you, I want to encourage you to open those up. Uh, or open your Bible app, um, and, and we're going to be looking at, at verses uh, 2 through 15. I'm going to read from the uh, New International Version today. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. <clears throat> Blessed, Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. As John was leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one whom it is written, I will send my messengers ahead of you. Who will prepare your way before you? There has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence, and violent people have been raised. For all the prophets and the law prophet prophesied until John. He is the Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears, let them hear. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, there's an interesting thing about advertising and marketing slogans. Sometimes you may have the best, most spot-on advertising slogan. You might have an advertising, a slick advertising firm uh, lined up to sell it, and you can do everything possible for it to be successful, and it might be successful in one location, but then when you try to translate it into a different culture or into a different language, sometimes it just doesn't work. Let me give you a few examples. Take KFC. For instance, we're all familiar with the finger licking good, right? Well, you probably don't want to say that in China because it translates as, we'll eat your fingers off. <laughs> or what about Green Giant? Remember Jolly Green Giant? You might scare off a few people in Arabic because it, it, it translates as intimidating green monster. <laughs> or what about Pepsi? Come with Pepsi. Man, that's a positive uh, uh, message, right? Just don't say that to anybody in China because it means Pepsi brings your ancestors back from the dead. 
And probably the worst of them all, Coors Light. Turn it loose. Not in Spanish. Suffer from diarrhea. (laughs) Some things just don't translate. And verse 12 is a head-scratcher because of the problems that we can sometimes have in translation. You know, Jesus spoke in Aramaic, which has a lot in common with Hebrew. And the gospel writers wrote in Koine Greek, uh, which was the predominant language of the Roman Empire. But then we get a hold of the verses, and and we have them translated into English. And and you, you can begin to see how different translators... I mean, the reason why we have so many different versions is because different translators have read the original Greek... And they've come up with different interpretations, uh, different uh, uh, readings, translations. Take, for instance, um, the Common English Bible, uh, their their translation of verse 12. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven is violently attacked as violent people seize it. But in the English Standard Version, we get... From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. The alternate reading of the New International Version reads as, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcibly advancing, and the violent people have been raiding it. And then we take the easy-to-read version. Since the time of John the baptizer until now, came until now, God's kingdom has been going forward strongly, and people have been trying to take control of it by force. So, in, in some translations, the kingdom of heaven is violently attacked or subject to violence. While in others, the kingdom is forcefully advancing or forcibly injured. That's not the same, is it? So what's the problem? Part of the reason it's so hard to completely agree on the sense of this verse is because it was the way it was written in Greek. You see, in the original, uh, the original language, the phrase can either be translated in an active or in a passive sense. And so, an active interpretation would lead us to this idea of the kingdom forcefully advancing, going forward. Whereas a a passive interpretation would lead us toward the sense of the kingdom being violently attacked. So, if, if Greek is hard to understand here, then how can we today get a sense for what Jesus is getting at then in this verse? Which is it? Attacking? Is it advanced? Being attacked or is it be advancing? Well, as I said before, the, one of the most important things we can do in, in our study as part of our Bible reading is the context, is understanding context. Verses don't appear in a vacuum. They're a part of a, a greater narrative. And so to understand it, we need to understand the narrative. We need to understand what's going on. And so... Uh, This whole context of our scripture this morning takes place with with John the Baptist. He's in jail, okay? And and John has been in jail for for quite some time. In fact, he's been kind of wasting away for months. And and so he was imprisoned by by Herod Antipas uh, because John had been criticizing the marriage of of Herodias, uh, uh, who was Herod's brother's wife. Um, and so, so just Antipas had, had a divorced his first wife, and, and Herodias had basically left uh, her husband for, for Antipas and had married them. And so John the Baptist stepped right into a first century soap opera and inserted himself and got thrown in prison as a result. He had been this bold prophet preparing the way for the Messiah. And so imagine... If you have been doing everything you were supposed to do, you've been preaching the gospel, you've been preparing the way, and all of a sudden you, you, you get thrown 
thrown in, in, in prison and you're just sitting there. He's likely discouraged, possibly because of his long imprisonment and because Jesus had not acted in the way that he, was, he expected. See, he was the last in the line of Old Testament prophets. In fact, Jesus calls him this great person and, and identifies him as a prophet like Elijah who would call people to repentance and, and help them to prepare the way of the Lord. Yet, John, like the disciples and, uh, and other people in Jesus' day, they expected Jesus to, to be more of a political leader. They expected him to be someone who would, who would free the Israelites from oppression and, 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 uh, by Rome and, and lead Israel into this new age of peace and, and prosperity and salvation. And so, John sends his followers to Jesus with a legitimate question. He asked him, hey, are you the one we should expect or, or should we be waiting for someone else? And so John, J Jesus answers John's questions not with some vague set of promises. Rather, he, he gives them observable facts. Jesus says to John's disciples to go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. In other words... The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, the leprosy, those with leprosy are cured, the dead are raised, and the kingdom of, of the gospel of the kingdom is being proclaimed. Jesus is giving John evidence that the new age of healing and salvation is being established, embodied in the ministry that Jesus is doing. In fact, Jesus identifies his ministry in Luke 4, uh, verses 18 and 19. And so what verse 12 here makes sense when we look at it as in the context of Jesus' message to John. We, what we're hearing is we're, we're, we're listening in on his words to John to let John know, hey, it's not either or, it's both and. The kingdom of heaven is forcefully advancing and it's under attack. In fact, Jesus even alludes to this in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Those who are ambassadors for the kingdom of God, those who are agents of the kingdom, will always be subject to misunderstanding. Always subject to alienation and violence. Jesus, our Lord, will be brutally executed. John will be beheaded. The disciples and the followers of Jesus in the early church will be persecuted and killed for their faith. So yes, persecution is part of the game. John also needed to be reminded that the kingdom of heaven is forcefully advancing. See, first, it's in the person of Jesus and his life, death, and resurrection. Then, through the pouring out of the Holy Spirit and, at Pentecost and the forming of the church. And then the whole world, through the work of Paul and his fellow laborers, and even today, It's not an either-or situation. It's not just an active or a passive sense. It's both. Both are valid interpretations, and both have implications for us as followers of Jesus. 
See, as followers of Jesus, we can expect suffering. As followers of Jesus, we can expect to be mischaracterized, even persecuted for our faith. The world is steeped in darkness, and, and, and those who worship God are often uh, described as the problem. And as followers of Jesus, we need to expect that those attacks will happen and not be surprised or dismayed by them. It happened to Jesus, and it can happen to us as Jesus' followers. But also, we need to open our hearts. We need to open our hearts and allow the kingdom to forcefully advance into it. Advance into our lives. We need to ruthlessly eliminate anything and everything in our minds and our hearts that not, is not of the kingdom. Jesus said, and if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. Remember, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, it's not just about when Jesus will come and restore all creation. It's not just a futuristic uh, uh, supposition. The kingdom is about reign and the will of God having control of our hearts and our lives Today, the kingdom of God will prevail. We've already read how it ends. We know how the story ends. Guess what? Jesus wins. Sorry, spoiler alert. Jesus wins. God wins. The kingdom of God wins. The kingdom of God conquers. And even though we may presently be under attack by the powers of this present and evil age, that's not the whole story. But I, I love how Talbot Davis says it. He says, Jesus has to conquer his friends before he conquers his enemies. He has to conquer his friends before... He, it's, it's, it makes so much sense. When I read that, I was like, whoa! Whoa! It's true. It's right there in the Gospels. Where, who did Jesus spend the most time with throughout his ministry? The disciples, his friends, his followers, the, the, the 12, and then above, beyond the 12, the 70 and plus. He had to conquer their hearts. He spent more time convincing them and conquering their hearts so that they would be prepared to take the kingdom further. Yes, there were people who were converted. Yes, there were people who were on the fringes. Yes, we hear about Nicodemus and other people. But, but we hear more about him conquering the hearts of, of, his, of his friends, not his enemies. But let me be really clear here. If he had not conquered the hearts of the disciples and those closest to him, we would not be here today. The movement would have stalled and the kingdom would not have advanced. If we want to be serious followers of Jesus, then it starts with ourselves. It starts with allowing God to forcefully advance into our lives through Jesus Christ. Some of us here, some of us online, may consider ourselves admirers of Jesus or even friends of Jesus. But we have to ask ourselves, have we given everything in our lives completely over to Jesus? Have we allowed him to conquer our hearts? so that we might share the good news with others and their hearts be conquered too. I want to share this last story as we close out. You know, Dr. Phil Meadows is a professor 
of evangelism and missional study communities at Asbury Theological Seminary. And he shared his faith story in a recent uh, episode of, of the Plain Truth podcast. He talked about coming to faith as, as kind of a gradual process. In other words, a gradual conquering of his heart by Jesus. And how, how he experienced the person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He was just getting out of university when, when he uh, considered whether or not to do a doctorate in, in chemistry. Uh, he wasn't sure what he was supposed to do. So, so he goes out into northern uh, Irish countryside near where he had grown up, and, and, and he sat down on an old stump, and he began thinking and considering what he, could, what he should do. And he describes how he had amazing time of intimacy with the Holy Spirit. It was, it was a, a powerful and beautiful time. And he said after that experience with God, he still didn't know exactly what he should do, but he realized he did not care. You see, he, what he wanted at that point then was to continually grow and to live into this close relationship with God. He wanted God to continually conquer his heart. He wanted to surrender more of who he was so that he could be who God wanted him to be. And I believe, friends, that that's what God is calling each of us to do. He's calling each of us to surrender our lives to him. See, God doesn't need any more admirers. What God wants is fully surrendered followers to suffer even violent attacks in order that the good news might be forcefully advanced in our own lives and in the lives of others. Would you pray with me? Oh, gracious, loving God, Lord, we give you thanks that we can be gathered here today and to hear your, your, your good news, that what you want from us is not simply our admiration and our, and our, and our, and our, our, our willingness to hear your words and, and to try to live by uh, your precepts. Lord, what you want is, 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 is us. You want us to surrender our lives and our hearts to you. You want to conquer us so that we can be truly followers and agents of transformation in this world. Where we know that there will be times when we are going to be attacked for our faith. And that can be a scary proposition. But at the end of the day, Lord, you win. We know that. So help us to remember that. Help us to hold on to that. And help us to open our hearts and our minds and our lives to you. To surrender them to you. That your kingdom may advance forcefully into this world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We pray this. Amen. You know, one of the ways in which God enters our lives and reminds us of His presence is through the celebration of His meal, His supper. 